What's up, everyone? So this is going to be a re-recording of what was a talk that I gave at the Fit for Service Mastermind Virtual Summit super recently here in 2020. And this talk was entitled Spiritual Alchemy, which is how to alchemize your spirit in the crucible of psychedelic or non-ordinary reality experiences. And I thought this talk was something I wanted to re-record and go ahead and post up on YouTube because I think it's a really, really useful framework for understanding some of the pieces that I think people commonly have missing, whether that's how to integrate after a psychedelic experience, what to do after a big breathwork ceremony, and just generally how to have a little bit more understanding of the way that people's mind works in progress and the different steps of the journey that we are kind of all on and which step you may be on right now because it's useful information to know if you're on a certain step and then you know what the next step is and you know some of the roadblocks to you progressing to that next step you'll find yourself in a much better place because you know what to do and you have a little bit of a guidebook or a compass to reference off of so i hope you enjoy this talk i will have a powerpoint going along with it so please do watch along because there's a lot of useful infographics as we go and without any further ado let's just jump right into the powerpoint all right so the title of this talk is spiritual alchemy how to alchemize the spirit in the crucible of psychedelic or non-ordinary reality experiences and this was a talk that came about for me when I had started really thinking about and trying to codify the different ways that I personally, after psychedelic journeys, have been able to integrate some really difficult lessons. Now, I'm going to give you fair warning here before we start the video. I'm going to share a lot of my personal story in this journey and some parts of those people may find triggering. So we are specifically going to talk about a sexual assault that I personally went through. And we're going to talk about depression and some other topics that are often a bit touchy for people. So if that's something you don't feel up for right now, this is your warning. Come find this video at a time where you're feeling a little bit better or more prepared. Without any further ado, though, let's just jump right in. So first off, what the fuck does all that word salad mumbo jumbo about alchemy crucibles and non-ordinary reality mean? So I find it useful at the beginning of a talk like this for us to spend a little bit of time unpacking some terms we're going to be using a lot, simply because without a good base understanding of what we're talking about, you may find yourself wondering every third word, what does that mean? So first term we'll be using is crucible, which is a ceramic or metal container in which metals or other substances may be melted or subjected to very high temperatures. Second term is magnum opus. So this is considered the great work by the alchemists, and it's what they strove to complete in their practices, basically turning lead into gold and purifying the individual spirit into divinity. And then individuation, which is a process and a term by Carl Jung. Individuation is the process where the individual self develops out of an undifferentiated unconscious. So it's kind of the process by which you specifically become who you were uniquely meant to be, and you differentiate yourself out of just being another cog in the wheel that doesn't know their purpose. The last term we'll talk about is non-ordinary reality. So this is a state of consciousness achieved through various different techniques. Could be psychedelics, could be breath work, could be meditation, could be spontaneous. And really the hallmarks of this state of consciousness are the dissolution of the ego, whether that's a complete dissolution or just a partial dissolution of the ego, and having increased access to what you could call the higher self, the inner voice, your inner knowing, the true self, your spirit, your soul, whatever terminology works for you. It's kind of the ego softens back, and as the ego softens back, the true self is able to shine through, and you're sort of able to see parts of yourself that are really underneath everything. And the questions I'm going to try to answer today is, why do we hold on so tightly to who we've been in the past? You know, it's something I see all the time. People come in and they're, they're really holding on as I'm coaching them. They're holding on to who they used to be because they have a lot of time and effort and pain invested in who they were. 
So we'll talk a little bit about why we hold on so tightly to who we've been in the past. We'll also talk about how can we create fundamental structural changes to our inner world or our psyche that are going to be stable foundations for us to build off of into the future. And we'll talk about what the most difficult experiences or emotions are to alchemize. So what are the specific emotions or experiences that people may have had that are going to be really, really difficult to work through? And then what are the steps to working through those? We'll talk about which steps on the hero's journey or the magnum opus do people get stuck on the most often. And then we'll talk about how to identify where exactly we are stuck and how we can move through that phase into the next phase. So the first thing is, why alchemy? Why the fuck should I care? <laughs> and it's a question you may be wondering because alchemy sort of to us in modern times is this ancient magic, black magic, whatever, really has lost a lot of its meaning in terms of what it used to be. <clears throat> so we'll talk about this from a couple different angles. First of all, I believe pretty firmly that anytime we can gain a new lens through which we can examine both ourselves and our stories and the world, we get a unique opportunity to see our spirit with fresh eyes. And in my view, that's always a good thing. Any chance to see yourself from a different angle provides an opportunity for growth because you're getting a fresh eye, a fresh look on what you are and how you exist in the world. Number two in my experience is most people or many people have an incomplete conception of really how to view psychedelic experiences or how to, do, how to view peak experiences. They kind of look at them as like a quick fix, magic pill, magic bullet. And the metaphor that I give people is these experiences are a lot more like a forge. They heat up your spirit or your psyche or your soul, whatever you want to call and they make it temporarily malleable so it's able to be shaped into something new however if when you return to the normal world you simply pour that right back into the same exact mold that you had been existing in beforehand you find yourself really quickly hardened back into the same old you that you had been before and that can be really really discouraging for someone especially if they felt like they had a big revelation and nothing changed. So we'll talk a lot about that, and we'll talk a little bit about why the framework of the magnum opus and the hero's journey are sort of the ancient natural guidebooks for how to integrate these big type of experiences. So we'll talk a little bit also about Carl Jung and alchemy, aka people way smarter than myself, really thought a lot about this stuff and think it's important. So you may want to take a look at it as well. Carl Jung saw in the processes of alchemy a natural parallel to his process of individuation. And really that was a breakthrough, breakthrough for him on a couple different levels. First and foremost, it kind of provided a lot of data to support his theory of the collective unconscious. But more specifically, the idea that psychic transformation follows an archetypal and universal process. And I'm going to repeat that again because I think it's one of the most important parts of this talk. And if you leave with nothing else than this understanding, this is the piece to hold on to. Psychic transformation follows an archetypal and universal process. That is to say, you turning in to who you are meant to be follows a very specific and universal process that everyone can experience the same if they choose to. And this transformative process happens through really the integration of the conscious and the unconscious aspects of your psychology. So there's things that are sitting below the surface, there's shadows down in the deeps that perhaps you haven't taken a look at yet. And as you look at those and you integrate those with what is your conscious mind, you start to really come to a whole new understanding of yourself and you go through this process by natural process. So we'll also talk a little bit about just alchemy for a second and just touch on it really quick because it's something that I think gets left by the wayside. But if we talk a little bit about the history of it, when alchemy was first coming about was about 100 to 200 AD. And that was in 
Egypt first and foremost, and alchemy really is the precursor to most modern science. And this is something that people I don't think know or understand, but alchemy itself was really the first time where humans had committed themselves to getting a process of testing something, retesting something, examining results, and seeing what goes on forth forthright from that. So they would go through the process of, okay, we're going to try to melt this specific metal down, and then we're going to burn off the impurities, and then we're going to let it harden, and we're going to record our results. What happened as a result of this? So really that laid the foundation for what we now consider the scientific method. Obviously it took us a long time to get to where we are now, but alchemy really laid the groundwork for that, as well as just like the obvious correlation where alchemy was the direct precursor to chemistry, because these were the first chemists. And alchemy also had a second side of the process that it was talked about and is maybe more useful to us today. So the second side of alchemy was the idea of the alchemy of the spirit or the alchemy of the self. And that was the idea that you could, through very careful and intentional self-work, turn yourself into the best version of you you could be and that in doing so, you would essentially be becoming a paragon of existence in your physical body. So we'll talk a ton more about that throughout the talk. And let's go a little deeper on Carl Jung and alchemy. So Carl Jung had four stages of psychic transformation, aka individuation, that he laid out. And those four stages were confession, elucidation, education, and transformation. And then this maps onto the four stages of alchemy, and we'll talk about these much more in depth. But the four stages of the magnum opus were Negredo, Albedo, Citrinitas, and Rubedo, which is black, white, yellow, red. And what I find really interesting about these four steps in particular is just how many parallels there are in places that had really no contact with this process. And I think it's, it's useful to think about that it's not like they're accessing this magical place in the world where they're getting this info. What I, what I think it points more to is that these are fundamental pieces of the human consciousness and the human experience. And all of these different systems are humans' way of trying to capture and write down what they have experienced. So the magnum opus of alchemy, the hero's journey, right here, the Native American medicine wheel. This is us as human beings trying to write down psychic phenomena and capture them in a way through myths, through stories, that is an easy way for us to understand. So we're gonna talk more about the alchemical magnum opus and the hero's journey. I was really, really shocked when I started to do the groundwork and the research for this talk that the magnum opus of alchemy, the 12 steps laid out there, and the hero's journey 12 steps really map onto each other one to one and they almost actually provide a fleshing out of each other where each of them complements the other with a little bit of added detail that perhaps was missing from the original. So we're gonna go super in depth into each of these and we'll talk a ton about them further in the talk. First though, we're going to flip over and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my personal story and we can take a look at the ways that my own journey has directly mapped onto these things because I think it's going to help provide a more humanizing and a more concrete examples that you could perhaps use in your personal life that will make a little bit more sense than some of these concepts which could be a little bit abstract at times. So as we talk about my personal story, let's go ahead and rewind the clock to 2012. So 2012 was a really tumultuous year for me. I was freshly 21 and as 21 year olds do, I had a massive alcohol problem. I was drinking like four nights a week and almost every time I was drinking, it was to blackout or close to blacking out. Essentially, I constructed my entire ego at that time around women, partying, and I kind of had a lot of internal excuses for anything that would go wrong in my life. Basically, I'm young, I deserve to party, and I was just missing a ton of days of work at my job and a little bit of context you know as someone that didn't go to college 
I went to half a half a year of community college. I didn't get a real degree. I had worked my way up in a company to a position where I was the offsite manager of a, a manufacturing location. And it sort of was something that I had attached a lot of myself to because I'm like, okay, I worked my way up. I did this thing without having a college degree. And I was quite proud of myself in that. In January of 2012, my boss finally had enough. And really, you know, I have empathy for him in that moment because you can't really have an off-site manager who misses a day every other week or even a day a week because they're hungover. So I got fired. And I remember at this time just feeling absolutely shattered. Like my job was my one saving grace. It was my only piece of external validation that was a positive all of my other external validations were sort of negative cycles like women and drinking where i would just not be getting good feedback so i kind of at that point i heard the initial call to change my life uh, but i refused to listen to it um, as happens with many of these things it's like i i allowed myself to double down on the partying and i found a crappy night shift job that was paying well and i was working 6 p.m to 6 a.m five or six days a week most weeks and i was making a ton of money which was cool but i wasn't saving absolutely any of it and sort of what was interesting about that time in my life was i i found a night shift job specifically because i was like oh this will make it easier to party i'll be able to go out at night and i won't be getting tired because it's a night shift job so my schedule on my weekends and my schedule during the week will be the same. There's a quote from Carl Jung that I think is really applicable to this period in my life. And he said, hell is when you know that everything serious that you have planned with yourself is also laughable, that everything fine is also brutal, that everything good is also bad, that everything high is also low, and that everything pleasant is also shameful. And that really is how I felt at that time. I was hyper aware that the things which were bringing me temporary joy, like drinking, seducing new women, were also the things that were causing me continued pain. They were very temporary fixes on my ego and my self-esteem. The awareness of that, though, really just meant I had to become even more committed to my vices. It took more alcohol, more partying than ever to extinguish the pain beneath. Then in March of 2012, I was sexually assaulted, and I remember, I remember going out to a bar with my friends, like we did every weekend, essentially, and they wanted to leave early, around 11 p.m., and this is pretty common. You know, I would go out with my friends, and I want to stay out all night, because I'm there to party the whole way through 2 a.m. when the bars close here, and to even find an after party if I could. So when they wanted to leave at 11 p.m., I was like, I'm just getting started. You guys can leave if you want to. I'm definitely staying here. I haven't even talked to any women yet. Like, what do you mean? We're not going home. So they leave, and I only remember that night having two maybe three drinks which for me at that time in my life you know I, I could have 14 or 15 drinks and I would be coherent I wouldn't be sober by any stretch of the imagination and I would be close to blacking out but I'd be coherent I'd be standing be okay so having two or three drinks was like nothing then complete blackness don't remember anything and I wake up and I'm laying in a room I don't recognize on a bed I don't recognize and I kind of like blink my eyes a couple times and look around and just like just sort of had this immediate like fight or flight response like what the fuck's going on and I look down and some guys at the edge of the bed like trying to pull my pants down around my ankles and he'd already gotten them like to my knees and I kind of struggled to an upright position. Um, I'm a fairly large human, and he was fairly small, maybe five, five four to five six, and I'm six three. So as I became conscious and sort of struggled up, he really seemed just surprised that I was awake at all, and I kind of pushed him off of me. Um, I remember 
feeling so feeble, like my legs were made out of jelly. Um, and in retrospect, like obviously I had been roofied. Um, but in the moment, I didn't really even, it didn't cross my mind. I'm like, did I get too drunk? Like, what's going on here? And I, can't, I count myself lucky from this in a multitude of ways, but specifically that I was bigger than the guy, so he didn't really put up much of a fight, and I was able to get my pants back on and get the hell out of there. And this really was a wake-up call for me. I think, especially as a guy, there was this sense before then of invincibility and like what could go wrong. I'm young, I'm in good shape, I can take care of myself, and I'm going to be okay no matter what. And this really shook my foundation because it really made me consider like, could I be so sure if I continued down my path of partying that something much worse wouldn't happen to me, whether it would be me actually fully getting raped or it would be someone getting in a fight and pulling a gun on me like what could happen really it shifted my perspective so fast forward a little bit i, I kind of started to listen to some podcasts on my night shift job since i was working 12 hour shifts most evenings i was probably getting through like eight to ten hours of podcasts an evening and podcasts were my first access point where i began to allow a glimmer just a glimmer of hope to creep in that perhaps i as an entire human was not yet unsalvageable i randomly on a super super early tim ferris episode he mentioned just offhand like a one-liner mushrooms really helped with my depression i was immediately intrigued like that called out to me right away and I had tried mushrooms before when I was younger, when I was like 16, and I went and saw that that old movie, American Gangster, with Denzel Washington and T.I. in it. it. wasn't a great experience. I don't recommend that to anyone. But, you know, after hearing Tim Ferriss, who was someone I, like, respected a lot, just in terms of how smart he was and how much he had worked on himself and the thoughtfulness he put into most things he did, when I heard him say that, it made me reframe and go, okay, maybe there's something more there that I should dig into so i just started to research i was really willing to try anything at this point because the feeling internally was like would death like if this caused me to die somehow would that actually be worse than what i was feeling i don't know it wasn't that i was like actively suicidal but if i had gotten hit by a bus i think i would have been okay with it at that point so there was sort of a fuck it i'll try whatever works mentality going at that point and after about a month of just continually searching um, for mushrooms I found a large amount of them and down the hatch went five grams which of all the parts in this talk this is the part where I want to be very clear this is not a recommendation I'm not encouraging you to try this or even something like this this is just a recounting of my experience, and in some ways I kind of got away with one here, so take that for what it's worth. Be careful. Use your own best judgment. But I threw five grams down my, down my throat hole, and I took them alone in my apartment in the dark, and I had an experience that I think the best way to describe it is that I every molecule of my being absolutely dissolved into the totality of the entire universe and every single molecule of that being was just surrounded by unconditional love which in that moment where i had so little self-love was exactly what i needed and it kind of solidified my will to live again because i knew if that could happen then i could move forward so filled with a new lust for life, I kind of began my reconstruction project on my own self. Uh, I created and wrote out a blueprint for how I would seek to dig up the foundation of who I was before, pull all that out, and then pour a new foundation that I could actually build off of. I started taking my health seriously again. I restarted meditation, and I reduced but not stopped the amount I was going out drinking. So I was going out more like once a month at that, or once a week at that point, rather than four nights a week. I prepared myself for a month and a half before my next mushroom trip. And I knew from some deep place in my soul that I probably wasn't going to get off so easy on this next trip. 
and that it was unlikely that it would be all rainbows and unicorns this time around, which I was absolutely correct in that analysis. In this second five gram trip, I basically, you know, same circumstance, in the dark, um, five grams, went in deep, and I was basically dragged through a timeline of everything I had ever done wrong while drinking. I was shown all the friends I had disrespected and lost over the years from just, you know, if we had plans to hang out that night, I would just throw those plans to the wayside if I had something better, air quotes, to do. Um, the wonderful women that I had met but I had ignored to go out and party instead because if we had already had sex, you know, as fucked up as it sounds, I was like, cool, mission accomplished. I already did the thing I wanted to do. And I think on a deeper level, parts of me were very scared of a deeper connection would cause me to have to examine myself. And I didn't want that. So it was like physical relationship and then cool, see you later, I'd rather go out partying. And even just like the cumulative like thousand dollars that I'd stolen from my dad at this point and wasn't paid back. Basically, the mushrooms walked me through what I consider like an adult castration, and they showed me that essentially I had no right to call myself a man at that point, and I had no right to even call myself an adult. After that trip, and you know, I don't talk about this specific trip very often to people because I think it can give them a, a fearful representation of what mushrooms can do. Um, but I think it is important in the context of this journey that this is a piece of it. And after the trip, I was just despondent. And I think really what I was experiencing in the, in the about month and a half afterwards was I was doing five years of repentance, five years of feeling shame that I should have been feeling within a month. So it was extremely condensed in all of these instances where I did something fucked up that I shouldn't have done. I was now re-experiencing and having to go through and just like deal with them emotionally. So it was a painful, painful process. And I can't emphasize enough that like I was one or two things going wrong away from just like ending it and saying, all right, throwing in the towel, I'm good. And this is where integration and having proper frameworks around you is really helpful. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later in this presentation. But I basically, the way I look at that experience was like I had to excavate down deep and pull up all the roots that had cracked my foundation of who I was. And it was one of the hardest things I've ever done. It probably is one of the hardest things I will ever do because there's so much down there that I had been ignoring at that time. However, I soldiered on after the trip. I slowly made peace with what I had done. And as the messages from that trip began to sink in, I prepared myself for my next trip about a month and a half later. Same five grams, same dark room, different day, as if I was going to do anything different at this point. So I had a vision at that point that I remember so vividly to this day that it's almost like I'm standing right there. Um, I saw myself standing at the base of this giant mountain and this mountain stretched up into the stratosphere and out of view to where I couldn't see it and the mushrooms or my inner self or however you want to reference this told me this is your potential. This is what you can accomplish if you are willing to seize your internal power. You are currently at the bottom of the mountain. And that was more terrifying to me than the entire previous trip. Um, you know, in the previous trip, I had been sort of dragged over the coals for fucked up shit I had done. And while that was really painful and had a lot of shame involved, it, it had a very clear path forward on it where it was like, process the shame, make things right, and you'll be able to work through this. This, however, man looking up at my purpose and i think this is for all of us um, it's not unique to me by any means but we all have potential it's so big and the thought that went through my head just like what if i fail because my purpose is so big and what i can do is so large would i then be letting down not just myself but also everyone in the entire world by not coming to shine my unique gift 
And again, this is something that I believe everyone has within them. We all have unique gifts that we are here specifically to bring to the world. And as I was kind of questioning those things internally during the trip, there's just like a voice from deep within me that vibrated out of me and responded like, you can only fail if you don't try. And that was the end of the trip. And I, I felt like I was floating, like I had been gifted a new life and I wasn't really touching the ground. And I was just like telling people about this amazing thing and I got it figured out and I know what to do now. And so that trip was supposed to be my last trip in this little sequence of three. Um, after the first trip, I'd originally planned to just do two more trips, and then that would be sort of like I've done the groundwork for what I need to do to become who I'm supposed to be. Um, however, I didn't really want to lose the feeling I was experiencing at that point, so I got greedy, and I planned on the trip for only a month after that. And as soon as I sat down and entered the space, the medicine space for that trip, the message came through clear, crystal clear. It was just, do not return to the medicine space for a long time. Your work is to be done in the physical plane. Go and spread your love. Go and spread who you are. Do not come back for a while. And that was a wake-up call for me. Cause, oh, okay, it's not always giving me good messages. Sometimes it's just telling me, hey, asshole, quit coming here for a while and go do the real work. So I heeded that message and I started to take my life a little more seriously. I didn't drink a single drop of alcohol for a whole year after this last trip. I built up my good habits. I paid back my dad slowly but surely and I became, began to repair the damage done step by step like I was supposed to. And after that trip was when I really started to spread the word about psychedelics with kind of my close friends and family. I started to share my story a little bit with those around me that I cared about, helping to sort of give them permission to share their story because I had finally given myself permission to share my story. Now, if you're already familiar with the steps of the hero's journey, parts of my story might stand out to you as really like obvious pieces of that journey. And just the point of telling all this is as we go through these different steps of the magnum opus and the hero's journey, try to keep my story top of mind for each step as a way to help humanize and give you real concrete context of what these steps mean. All right, so that was a little bit of my personal story. Now we're going to dive right back into the actual steps of the hero's journey and of the magnum opus so we can get a little more context of what each of those steps are and you can start to piece together what, which one of these steps you may feel you're at and then we'll dive deeper into that at the end as well. So the first step of both the magnum opus and the hero's journey. So... The magnum opus has this first step, calcination. And a lot of these words are going to be unfamiliar. They're certainly unfamiliar for me. So this is just really, it's best thought of as when something is heated up super hot, at like an ore or a solid material, and it, it's brought to a super high heating point to bring about a thermal decomposition. And there's this idea of philosophical calcination, which is like when horns or hooves are hung over boiling water and the mucilage which is sort of the connective glue starts to come out of them and they're easily reducible into powder you can consider this just the structural glue holding things together begins to fall apart we map this onto the hero's journey which is the ordinary world so in this first step of the hero's journey you're just living in the normal world with no sense of any impending issues and the hero, that's you or me, our inner and outer problems are first established in this step. So I kind of like to think of it as there are machinations or there are things going on in the background that are causing things to reach a breaking or boiling point, and we're maybe not aware of it. And it brings in the call to adventure, which is the next step of the hero's journey. And I'll also map this on to the Lord of the Rings for y'all, because I think it's a really useful context to understand this in, because it's so clearly laid out in that. So in this step, that's Frodo in the Shire. He's preparing to celebrate Bilbo's birth 
birthday, he's carefree, and he doesn't really have much of an idea of what's going on in the background that is causing things to reach this boiling point or this breaking point. And what's interesting about how this maps on to calcination of the magnum opus is this idea that like something is all of the connective tissue inside of it has been removed and it's one little flick or one little tap from falling completely apart and dissolving into dust and that's kind of how the first step of the hero's journey can feel it's like you're in the ordinary world everything's fine and everything's good and then one little thing goes wrong and you realize that things are actually falling apart and why are they falling apart i didn't realize it was like this this leads us into the next step of the magnum opus which is solution or dissolution so dissolution in alchemy represents a breaking down of the artificial structures of the psyche by total immersion in the unconscious or the rejected parts of our consciousness within the alchemist the dissolving water of dissolution can take the form of dreams voices visions strange feelings and kind of the idea is they reveal a less ordered and less rational world that has been existing simultaneous with our everyday life you can summarize that all to say things as they were fall apart this maps onto the hero's journey the call to adventure this is when the story first gets rolling the hero gets presented a challenge or a quest that must be undertaken and the call to adventure throws the ordinary world off balance establishes the stakes involved if the challenge is rejected and kind of lets the hero know like hey shit's going wrong you need to go do something about it this is when Frodo receives the One Ring to be guarded from Gandalf after Bilbo's departure. He's given the ring and he's told, like, this is really important. This is your task. You need to take care of this. This flips us into the next stage. So magnum opus, there's this idea of separation in alchemy. And in this stage of alchemy, they separate out the parts of the whole that were not being noticed before. So perhaps you had a iron ore and as you as you heated it up and you dis went through the step of dissolution you came to a spot where you would have the impurities or the other parts you weren't aware of had been boiled into a separate container and then you'd be able to see like oh, okay that's what was in there that we weren't aware of before so this is when we try to get out of our normal routine we try to alter our life in some way maybe we try to learn a new habit and it's really not uncommon for anger, resentment, frustration, and depression to emerge at this point. So we'll jump over to the hero's journey. Refusal of the call. This is the third step of the hero's journey, and that's when the hero refuses the journey because they're fearful, they're insecure, um, they just aren't sure they can do it. And the call to adventure they've received seems like too big a task. Like, I am not capable of this. This is really interesting because I think... I think with all of these steps of the magnum opus and the hero's journey, they're not just descriptive, like it's not just describing what happens, it's also prescribing advice of what needs to be done to move forward. So in this step, it's often the first time that someone becomes aware of the entirety of the full picture of their fears. and. Really, this is prescriptive advice because we have to become aware of what exactly our fears are and what our resistances are before we can overcome them. You can't overcome a fear if you have no idea what you're actually scared of, because how will you know when you've overcome it? So in this step, this is Gandalf returning to the Shire again, and he asks Frodo to take the ring out of the Shire ASAP. Frodo initially is just like, me? What? I don't want to. And he at one point offers the ring to Gandalf instead and is he doesn't actually get pushed past this point of leaving until the ring wraiths actually show up in the Shire and they have to escape. So I also jump back to separation for a second because I think it's a useful concept for people to understand. Oftentimes when we look at things like the hero's journey or the magnum opus, we only think of the positive side of it. So like if you're thinking about it in the context of Lord of the Rings, you've seen all the movies and you sort of like, okay, and then things work out and things go great. But it's important to acknowledge in the human experience in the real world, things don't always go great. And you need to understand what each step of the way is and how people can get stuck there. So either you can have empathy for yourself if that's where you're stuck, 
or you can have empathy for another if they are stuck in that place. So with separation, staying too long in that stage really is a root cause of addictions and avoidances. Essentially what happens psychologically is if you know you should be doing one thing and you slowly are taking deviations from that and you're doing something else, your brain begins to like literally separate its segments out to where you have a piece of yourself which is like let's call it the soul voice or the true knowing or your inner self that knows what should be done and then you have the pieces of your conscious mind they're trying to ignore that with everything they can possibly do so maybe you're doing drugs maybe you're drinking every night maybe you're addicted to food maybe you just can't handle yourself around anything and you just lie in bed like there's all these different coping mechanisms that get triggered when someone stays in this stage of separation so i say all this because it's important to understand like it's not just the successful version if someone's a really really heavy addict there's a good chance that they are just stuck in this stage they had their call to adventure and sometimes the call to adventure can be something like the death of a family member or it can be things fall apart and they lose their job but when it's those things, they have an, a choice. And if someone chooses to refuse the call and goes, my parents died and so now I'm just gonna never do anything productive again, when they choose to ignore the call, they have to numb themselves to calm down the pain that's going on in the background in their body and in their soul because there's a part of them that knows like you are meant for more than this and you're choosing not to pursue that. So this brings us to the fourth step of the hero's journey in the magnum opus, which is conjunction. So conjunction is the recombining of pure separated substances into a new compound. This process follows separation and it gives the alchemist the most genuine and essential parts of matter to use. Essentially, different matter is brought together through mixing or commingling. And this step in alchemy is also considered the mixing of the masculine and feminine and possible codependence, no sense of personal identity. I think this maps on to the hero's journey in a massive way. So the fourth step of the hero's journey is meeting the mentor. This is when the hero meets a mentor to gain confidence, insight, advice, training, or magical gifts to overcome their initial fears and face the threshold of the adventure. So this is Frodo arriving in Rivendell and the Fellowship of the Ring is formed. And that's like one of the critical parts of the movie it's so exciting they're all together and it's all of these different races and people coming together to move forward and pursue this task what i think is really interesting about these steps and we'll talk more about them later because i think this is one of the key critical steps that people do get stuck on is to really take yourself as an apprentice and to allow someone to truly be your mentor there's a certain amount of giving up pieces of who you are because you're accepting that you're going to do things their way. You're going to learn from them. And really, this is where the codependence can form, especially if that person is your partner romantically, is you kind of give up who you are completely and you don't pursue getting it back. It's okay to give up parts of who you are to learn from someone that you believe has something to teach you. But where we get stuck in this phase is when we just give ourselves up completely and have no responsibility because guess what? I'm just letting that person worry about it because they're my mentor. So that's the way these map onto each other in a very interesting way. Step five, magnum opus, putrefaction. So a substance is allowed to rot or decompose undisturbed. In some cases, the commencement of this process is facilitated with a small sample of the desired material to act as a seed similar to how when you're growing a crystal, you have a seed crystal you put in in that process. Carl Jung's quote really applies here. He goes, I behold death since it teaches me how to live. And really this step is about accepting or embracing our fears of death and persisting forward anyways. This maps onto the hero's journey, crossing the threshold. The hero finally commits to the journey. They're prepared to cross the gateway that separates the ordinary world and the special world and this crossing may require more than accepting one's fears, a map, or a swift kick in the rear from a mentor. This is the Fellowship of the Ring leaving Rivendell and committing to their purpose of destroying the ring. The part that's interesting about these two steps um, mapped onto each other is that 
there really is this sense of when you embark upon the journey of doing deep self work there is a commitment and there is there has to be an acceptance of death that comes with this so for me that acceptance was like i didn't really care if i lived or died i was so depressed and fucked up at the point that i was willing to try whatever but there's two paths to this there's that extreme where i felt just despondent and couldn't see myself as someone of value so fuck it why not try this there's also the other path which is the healthy embracing that you are going to have to kill your ego over and over again on this path to becoming who you want to be and that's really the prescriptive advice of these two pieces is like to move forward in this journey you have to embrace that your ego will have to die and to the ego that feels like you're going to die so there is this like built-in piece of this which is just so interesting to me that crossing the threshold which is in the hero's journey that's considered when the the hero passes into the special world they almost they have to pass through the acceptance of death and that's what frodo and the fellowship do when they leave rivendell they essentially commit to and they say it out loud they're like we don't know if we'll ever come back here don't know if this is going to work this is a wild idea but we've got to go for it because this is the only way forward and similar to putrefaction it's like you have to accept or even embrace those fears of death and be committed to persisting forward anyways this brings us to the sixth step so magnum opus it's congelation which is the process by which something congeals or thickens and there's a bunch of different ways this is achieved but essentially the substance increases in viscosity and sometimes that increase in viscosity is enough for it to crystallize or solidify the substance in question basically in this step with the commitment made in the putrefaction step the purpose and resolve of the individual are solidified this maps onto the hero's journey tests allies enemies the hero must prepare themselves for the greater ordeals yet to come and they need this stage to test their skills and powers or perhaps seek further training from the mentor the initiation into the into the special world tests and concretizes the hero's commitment to the journey and questions whether they can succeed so this is the mines of moria in lord of the rings this is meeting with galadriel in the forest this is the confrontation with boromir this is frodo and sam choosing to allow Gollum to guide them basically in this stage of the hero's journey the heroes become not sure of themselves but they become more confident in their abilities because they go through a few different a few different trials and tribulations on the path to their ultimate goal and this maps on to congelation like it's it's the thickening and the firming up of your purpose of who you are supposed to be and the starting to uncover an unknowing uh, the starting to uncover a knowing within yourself that you have a chance at doing this and that really is an essential step because if you have no confidence whatsoever you're not gonna be able to move forward on to the seventh step so magnum opus cybation this there's a poem there that you can read at your leisure that is from the book the compound of alchemy by george ripley it's the old alchemical text that is available for free online you can look it up but essentially this step is a careful feeding of the body and soul with sustaining food and habits and this is a preparation of the mind and the spirit for transformation to come this maps onto the hero's journey approach the inmost cave so in this step the hero must make preparations needed to approach the inmost cave that leads to the journey's heart or the central ordeal of the journey maps may be reviewed attacks might be planned they might do a rec recon mission um, basically before the hero can face their greatest fear or the supreme danger they need to make themselves as ready for combat as possible and the way this maps onto the real world is like if you're going to do a plant medicine or a psychedelic like it's the dieta beforehand it's you taking on voluntary restrictions before doing a plant medicine that are helping you to prepare yourself body and mind for the experience to come in the lord of the rings this is frodo's descent into shelob's lair and then he's rescued by sam from the tower subsequently after that 
and the two of them then commit themselves to death. They commit themselves to seeing their journey through. They finally have gone through enough steps that they have really just gone, we are absolutely committed to this and we will see it to the end. And this brings us into the penultimate step of the magnum opus and the hero's journey, sublimation. So matter goes directly from a solid to gas is sublimation. And really you can think of this as the transmutation of the spirit. The great task is undertaken to access your spirit, make it tangible, and separate it from its impurities. And this maps onto the hero's journey. The hero engages with the ordeal. The ordeal is the big step in the hero's journey. It's fighting the big, bad, evil guy. It's the experience of death. And it's the central, essential, and magical stage of any journey. Only through death can the hero be reborn. And only through death can they experience a resurrection that grants them greater powers or insight into how to take the journey to the end. So what is really, really interesting about this step is Frodo tries to throw the ring into Mount Doom. But his greatest fear at the beginning of the journey was that he would become tainted by its power and not able to complete the task, which is exactly what happens. He's going to throw it in, and he can't do it. He wants to keep the ring for himself, so he puts it on. And only through the death of the past ring bearer, Gollum, is he able to complete his ordeal. So there's a couple different interesting pieces to unpack here that are very, very archetypally accurate. So in this journey, this is so such like such a careful understanding needed for this, but I think it's so useful to the individual for Frodo to completely master his shadow because Gollum is his shadow. And he inherited Gollum from his father figure, Bilbo. So for Frodo to complete the ordeal, he had to kill the shadow that he inherited from his father. And that's an incredibly deep idea. This is the idea that for you to become who you really are, you need to kill off the parts of yourself that are the shadow that you inherited from your parents. It's beyond important. It's the penultimate step of the hero's journey for a reason. And it's so archetypally accurate because we inherit so much positive and negative from our parents. And only through the alchemizing and killing off of the shadow pieces that they have given down to us are we able to move forward and complete the task that we are here to do. This brings us on to the next step. Magnum opus, fermentation. So psychologically, this is the process where the codependence that was made during the conjunction meets its end. And this eventually results in the resurrection to a new level of being. So fermentation starts with the inspiration of spiritual power from above that reanimates, energizes, and enlightens the alchemist. And essentially, out of the dark of the alchemist's despair comes a brilliant display of colors and visions. And fermentation could be achieved through a ton of different ways in the idea of alchemy, but they especially thought intense prayer, desire for mystical union, breakdown of the personality, psychedelic drugs, and deep meditation were the ways to really get to this step. This maps onto the hero's journey, reward seizing the sword. So the heroes survive death and they've overcome the crisis of the soul and they slain the dragon, they've overcome their fears, and they now earn the reward that they are looking for. Psychologically, this is the discovery of your internal power and your discarding of your reliance on external, aka familial and friend and romantic crutches. And there's a quote from the movie here that I think is accurate in this context and it's, Frodo says to Sam, well, this is the end, Sam Gam This is the end, Sam Gamgee, said a voice by his side, and there was Frodo, pale and worn, and yet himself again. And in the eye and in his eyes there was peace now, neither strain of will, nor madness, nor any fear. There was the dear master of the sweet days in the Shire. Essentially, this is Frodo. He's restored to some of who he was as the burden of the ring. The shadow has been lifted from him. He gets back to the reward he sought, which was rest restoration and resurrection. 
This brings us into the next step, magnum opus exaltation. So this is the elevation of a person as to the status of a god. Essentially the refinement or subtilization of a body and the increasing of its virtue or its principal property. Now, this step is interesting, so we'll map it onto the hero's journey and we'll talk a little bit more about the interaction here. In the hero's journey, this is the road back. The hero must finally recommit to completing the journey and accept the road back to the ordinary world. A hero's success in the special world may make it difficult to return, and similar to crossing the threshold, the road back needs an event that will push the hero through the threshold and back into the ordinary world. So this is Sam and Frodo on Mount Doom. They've finished their task, and they've essentially given up hope of leaving the mountain alive. They're just like, let's just go out in the open air, and we're going to die here, but we did the thing we were supposed to do. So they feel good about that, but they've, they've acquiesced to death. And going back to the magnum opus, like this step is often, for people that get stuck here especially, the acquiescence to perpetual dreaming or unwillingness to use the knowledge gained back in the normal world. So in this step, this is where people often get stuck. They find themselves in this place post a plant medicine ceremony or post a big revelation that they can be a little bit detached. And they they come to this place of like, I have this new understanding of being and I don't need to interact in the normal world in the same way anymore. And it's not a full integration of lessons, and that's why this is so important, is like a part of the reason we do this work is so we can go in deep, we can slay the dragon, we can get the reward, and we can bring that reward back to our community. So this exaltation phase is the phase where you feel like, ah, yes, <laughs> I'm Christ, come back. I have resurrected, and I'm amazing. And it's like, there's parts of that where you have to then take on the integration back into the normal world. And that brings us to the next step, which in Magnum Opus is called multiplication. And essentially, there's a quote there you can read at your leisure, but essentially it talks about how as you multiply your knowledge, you need to continue to stoke the fire of what you've been learning and continue to work forward. And it's kind of a it's kind of an indication that you need to allow yourself to be humble and to know that you don't know things and to allow yourself to continue to work on your knowledge to be shared out. And this maps onto the hero's journey, which is the step of resurrection. So the ordeal and resurrection can re represent a cleansing or purification that now has to occur that the hero has made it back from the land of the dead. So essentially, the hero is reborn or transformed and they now have the attributes of what was them beforehand so them before they went on this journey in addition to the lessons and the insights from the characters they've met along the way on their journey so in the lord of the rings this is frodo and sam rescued by the eagles frodo lays in a deep slumber in Rivendell and then he awakes he's clad in all white and he's kind of like shining that's that's the resurrection step onto the magnum opus so projection um 12 12th step one of the most important steps if people don't accomplish this then the whole journey was kind of for no reason so the ultimate goal of Western alchemy is this idea of projection and that's once the philosopher's stone or powder of projection has been created it's the process of actually taking that and turning a lesser substance into a higher form. So in alchemy, this is just like lead into gold, but it can also be spiritual and it can also be how can I help those around me become who they are meant to be. And it's the idea of a bodhisattva or just like Christ consciousness of like once you become enlightened, air quotes, use that term gently there, then your job is to come back to the normal world and help wake others up. And this maps right onto the hero's journey. Return with the elixir. The hero has been resurrected, purified, and has earned the right to be accepted back into the ordinary world. The true hero returns with the elixir to share with others or to heal a wounded land. And this elixir could be a great treasure or a magic potion. It could be love, wisdom, or simply the experience of surviving the special world. But the injunction at this point is for the person to come back with their gifts and share it with the world or their community. 
This is in the hero's journey in Lord of the Rings when Frodo, Sam, Merry, and Pippin return to the Shire. And this is only in the books. So if you haven't read the books, you may not see this, but they had to clear out all of the invaders, which was Saruman in the end, with their newfound bravery and skills and help restore their home, the Shire, through the things they had learned on their journey. So they restore their home, through the battles and skills they've gained as they went along the journey and after so that's all 12 of the steps and all this research really left me with a couple core conclusions that i found really important that i think are useful ways to just approach this so the first one is you can never truly go home air quotes until you complete the full cycle of the magnum opus or the hero's journey if you find yourself longing for the past, it's a signal from your sub subconscious or it's a guidepost from your subconscious that you have dragons that are yet to be slain and you need to go find those motherfuckers and take them out. It's this, it's this idea that if we, when we get stuck in dwelling on the past, that's an indication that there is deep inner work left to be done. There are shadows unaccounted for and you will never get that feeling of home like, I feel totally at peace. I feel like I'm right where I need to be at the right time, unless you do some of this inner work. And this leads me into my next core concept here, which is one of my foundational beliefs is that when someone commits themselves deeply and wholly to the alchemy of their personal spirit, the ripples that their consciousness cause achieve functional immortality. And you can think of this on a ton of different levels. The easiest way to think about it is if you are this amazing writer and you just fully pursue writing like you know you're supposed to and you alchemize all the negativity in yourself and you turn yourself into exactly who you're supposed to be and you write these beautiful books as you do that the ripples that you writing these books cause is just unimaginably large every person that reads a book or tells their friend about it the impact it has on their life, the impact it has on their kids as a result of them changing, the ripples of your consciousness when you fully alchemize your spirit into what it's meant to be go on. And you can't see where they go, but they continue to ripple out. So this leads me to one of my other core concepts, which is the, the evolved or the alchemized spirit is malleable. As a person realizes their own divinity and interconnectedness, they simultaneously embrace all possibilities because if you know you're interconnected with everything, you know that any of the possibilities you perhaps see in front of you could be you if they aren't you right now. So you embrace all possibilities. It's sort of the death of judgment in the negative sense. And it's the birth of just that unconditional love piece. You know, you're malleable. So if someone comes at you with something that you weren't expecting and isn't the way you do things, you're able to immediately kind of go, oh, I see where you're coming from. You've lived your life to get to exactly where you are, and that has caused you to act like this in this moment. And that interconnected feeling allows you to operate in a way that's just so positive and so, so blasting forward with unconditional love. So let's refer quickly back to the questions from the beginning of the talk, and let's talk a little bit about each one in detail, and then we're actually going to dig into some images that I think you'll find helpful as reference points for everything we talked about. So first question was, why do we hold on so tightly to who we have been in the past? And I think there's a couple reasons for this. Number one, the ego wants to attach to the safe, known world. The ego wants to continue to do things that it had already done because it knows that those are safe and you won't die. Number two, you may find yourself, and I found myself like this before, like surrounded by people who are attached to an outdated version of who you are because it provides them with value or a service. So in my own context, like I had a lot of friends that liked partying when I loved partying and they were really attached to me as the party guy because I would bring them to the good parties. So at the moment where I started to kill off the party guy part of myself, those around me started to get almost like upset with me. Like, dude, what? You don't want to come out and party? Because they had an attachment to who I was before that. And they had a piece where they fit me into their life of, ooh, Alex is going to bring me to the fun place. So when I started to change that, it was no longer the service they wanted. And that caused, it, caused some prickles. If you're not aware of that fact, 
You can find your friends and family and loved ones pulling you back down, and they may not even be conscious of why. And one of the most common reasons is you allow fear to be your master. If you allow fear to dominate your life, you will find yourself stuck in who you used to be consistently. Next question that we are seeking to answer at the beginning. So how can we create fundamental structural changes to our inner world that will provide stable foundations for us to move forward? So the easy answer here is complete the full cycle of the magnum opus or of the hero's journey. You've got to actively search for what stage you may be stuck in currently, acknowledge the sticking point, and find your own unique WD-40 to unstick that motherfucker. And what are the most difficult experiences or emotions to alchemize? And there's a few different ones we'll talk about here. So deep emotional trauma is probably one of the most difficult ones. You know, if you've been sexually assaulted or you've been beaten or you've experienced abandonment, those can be really, really difficult uh, to work through. Shame is another huge one. Shame is like one of the most difficult, heavy emotions to hold on to. And another one is admitting personal wrongdoing or agency in traumas. When you something bad happens to you, you then have to deal with the fact that for that thing to not happen again, you need to find a new way to be in the world to proceed forward. And that can be really difficult because it almost is like admitting that there's something you could have done better in the past, and that's painful. So those are some of the most difficult emotions. And let's talk a little bit about which steps of the hero's journey of the magnum opus do people get stuck on the most. There's a few different ones here that I think are critical points that I see a lot of people stuck in. Meeting the mentor conjunction. People get stuck in loops of codependence and they become unwilling to stand on their own or unwilling to truly submit to the idea of death or ego death. The road back and exaltation. People get stuck in these loops of what I would call like a messiah complex where they get this resistance because they feel so enlightened from the experience they had. They get this resistance to then integrating their awakening back into the ordinary world. And as a result, they can be kind of detached or kind of not caring, or they go and isolate themselves in Costa Rica and build a commune because they don't want to face the real world. And they don't want to do the work of bringing that medicine back to the tribe. So they just take the medicine for themselves and they hightail it out of there tests allies enemies or congelation this is an interesting one because people really get stuck can get stuck in that initial feeling of victory after their first breakthrough so let's say you know you have a problem with drinking and you break through and you kind of stop drinking for a little while and you're just like yes i did it it's amazing i don't need to do any more inner work but realistically, there are bigger fears that are lying below the surface, and the real dragon that you're here to slay is underneath it all and still waiting to be confronted. So when you just kind of focus on these band-aid fixes to things, then it can be easy to get wrapped up in that and be excited about it instead of doing more painful work and confronting the deep, dark truths that you maybe don't want to look at. And this last one is how do we identify where we are stuck and how can we move through that phase to the next one? So I'm going to jump over to another image here and we'll take a look at that and you'll be able to see a little bit of how I like to break this down and what emotions you might be feeling at each stage. All right, so we're going to take a look at a couple of images that I've created as sort of guidebooks for how to better understand both the magnum opus and the hero's journey in relation to your own personal journey. So this first image here I've dubbed the hero's magnum opus, which would translate to the hero's great work. And this is just an image that I will link to in the notes of the video that you have access to both what the part of the hero's journey is, as you can see on top here where it says ordinary world and that has a brief description, as well as the part of the magnum opus that is correlated to that part of the hero's journey. So you have both of those stacked right on top of each other. And then in the center here of the circle, you have the emotions that are associated with each part of the journey here. And we'll dive a little bit deeper into each of these as we go. 
but this can just be a really useful image at a glance to sort of identify what part of the hero's journey you are at and it's a really really good way to visualize it you may also notice the yellow bar that goes across the middle there dividing it that is the separation between the ordinary world and the non-ordinary or the special world um, so this image will do you well it's a useful image for you to kind of unpack some of what you're experiencing and to quickly at a glance place what you're experiencing and we're gonna hop over to this other guide here which I think is the more easily useful piece um, a little bit less visually stunning but still quite useful so this has all of the pieces laid out in order and then next to them it has the related emotion same as the other image and then it also has the roadblocks to moving forward so i'm going to go through these really quick and we're going to touch on them a little bit and then we'll also relate some of the parts of my story to each of these parts so first off calcination or the ordinary world this is the basic step for me this is when i was just drinking blissfully i had no idea that anything was really wrong at the beginning because i was like oh i'm young i deserve this this is how i'm supposed to be existing in the world so it's sort of categorized the related emotion in that stage is i call it blissful air quotes ignorance because you have no conception of just how much might be wrong now that doesn't mean you'll be happy but it might mean that you're just kind of floating along through life with no real conception of something being wrong and the real roadblock to moving forward in that stage is lack of awareness that could be lack of awareness of the people around you lack of awareness of the situation you're in or most commonly lack of self-awareness you're not in tune with your internal voice at all brings us forward to the solution or dissolution call to adventure stage so the related emotions here are going to be confusion depression hopes hopelessness just a general malaise over your entire emotional state and really that's brought on by the fact that things fall apart you're confused you're you're a little bit just like depressed you're like why are things like this i thought they were good and the roadblocks to moving forward at this stage are feeling out of control and blaming external circumstances so we all know that person who everything that has ever happened in their life it has always been someone else's fault and woe is me and my life is falling apart because of other people that's the roadblock to moving forward out of this stage if you continually blame things outside of yourself you are giving away your power to all of the circumstances around you rather than going i am going to work on what i am capable of working on to move forward that brings us forward to step number three which is separation or refusal of the call now as i laid out before this is actually a prescriptive piece of advice you actually need to do this step to move forward effectively in your hero's journey because if you don't become aware of the things you are fearful of or the things you are resisting how can you effectively overcome them the related emotions here are going to be fear feeling numb feeling angry resentful frustrated and all of these feelings are coming about because you're sort of you're running into for the first time that things are really going to take a lot of work to undo or to put back in their place and that can make you feel angry it's like wow why do i deserve for all these things to fall apart and for me to have to deal with this the roadblocks to moving forward out of this stage are going to be denial of reality you know let's say you found out your spouse was cheating on you and you know for a fact they were cheating on you you know it's not the right relationship but so many of us will just go back into the relationship and tell ourselves a story like let's make this work we can do this i believe we can make this work that type of denial of reality is what is going to cause us to stay stuck in this stage we also might encounter escapism or no self-confidence you know escapism that could be through drugs alcohol food all of our different addictions can really manifest at this stage if we stay here too long if we try to escape from the reality of the pain we're feeling you're going to find yourself just slowly trying to numb your life away and that's no way to live your life and again no self-confidence at this stage things have fallen apart and you have some awareness that it's at least partially your fault and as you have that awareness you can be really down on yourself so you move into step four and that's conjunction or meeting with the mentor now 
the related emotions here are going to be dependence on another. You may feel enamored with your new mentor or your new lover. You may feel inspired by them. And really, this stage is categorized by you finally seeking outside help. It's you going out and finding the person who can help show you a way to make things better. Perhaps that's just a friend, a close trust, trusted loved one, or a literal formal mentor who perhaps you hire, or just someone at work you know who can help you forward in your journey. But however you may feel, you're kind of going to feel dependent to them because they're helping you so much and you feel like you're not giving anything in return. And really the roadblocks to moving forward out of this stage are going to be codependency, a lack of boundaries, and unwillingness to accept or seek help. So we'll break each of those down a little bit. The first one that you may run into is unwillingness to accept or seek help. You know, you may have people around you who see that things are terrible for you and they want to offer you help. And you may go, no, 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 I don't want help. I've got this. I've got this. When you do that, you rob this stage of its power. This stage, the power in it is receiving help from others. Same thing for asking for help. If you have fallen into this stage, things have fallen apart for you, you need to ask for help from others. And that asking for help from others is what is going to draw you forward into the next stage of the hero's journey. And for me, this stage was really when, after I had dealt with the refusal of the call, I had fallen into that stage where I was I was really despondent after my sexual assault and I was finding myself in a place where I was just really, really down on myself. And what I did or how I called in mentors at this point was I started listening to podcasts. I knew that I had to find a way for me to start getting some more positive information into my brain. And so I started listening to people like Tim Ferriss. And once I listened to those podcasts, it started to ignite just a glimmer of hope in my head that things could be different than they currently were. So the other, the other problems with this stage, the other potential roadblocks are going to be codependency and lack of boundaries. So codependency is going to rear its head when you over rely on someone else. And this is a problem that comes around a little bit further. But basically, when you, when you become so enmeshed with the person that you are seeking help from, that you no longer are getting any sense of self out of this like the idea of this whole journey is to become who you specifically are truly supposed to be so if you just take on someone else's personality then you're not moving forward towards being who you are truly supposed to be and again lack of boundaries same thing if you find yourself in a negative relationship where someone is just taking advantage of you you have to be able to set that boundary you have to be able to go "Mm, no further this is where my boundary is so then we cross into the fifth step, which is putrefaction and crossing the threshold. At this stage, you might feel committed, purposeful, focused, like you've got a goal in mind and you finally become committed to it. And this stage is really representative of a major shift that you may feel within yourself. You know, you may, you may reach this stage and you've come to a point where you have committed yourself to moving forward. You have given a commitment that whatever it takes, whether that's the death of your ego, whether that's a lot of pain and suffering, you are going to move forward through this. And that gives you a sense of commitment. It gives you a sense of purpose, finally. You're feeling a little bit like you have some direction, which is a wonderful thing as it comes about. Now, the roadblocks here are going to be non-acceptance of death as a possibility and unwillingness to commit. Now, we'll tackle the easy one first there, unwillingness to commit. That just means that you find yourself just wavering in the wind and you won't pick and do the thing that you know in your heart is going to help you move forward. It's as simple as that. You know if you get quiet and listen to yourself, listen to your emotional state, and listen to that inner voice, you know the thing you are supposed to do next if you are at that stage. And if you are unwilling to commit to it, you're going to find yourself stuck at this stage for a long time. You're going to cause yourself a lot of pain. The other piece of it is the is the non-acceptance of death as a possibility. Now, this is a little bit complicated because it's really two different kinds of death that we're talking about here. Number one is, of course, just literal physical death. Now, that's not to say you'll magically die by embarking upon this journey, but many, many people live their life in a state of fear constant fear 
of literal physical death. So they find themselves in a place where all of their actions are just trying to play safe and play small and let me keep what's mine and let me not take any big risks because what if I die? And that's, again, it's no way to live your life. Now, much more common, I think, or much more prevalent and insidious is the fear of the death of the ego. So at this stage, I'll give a really simple example that I think really applies broadly here and can paint a good picture of why this can be such a problem. Let's say you've always dreamed of being a stand-up comic, and you know you're pretty funny amongst your friends, but you know you're going to need to get up on stage to be a real stand-up comic, to be actually having your own special on Netflix. And knowing this, you have a ton of fear about going up on stage because you know that first time, that second time you go up there, you're going to fucking be terrible. Like, you're not going to land all your jokes. People are not going to love your performance the whole way through. So if you don't accept that your ego is going to need to die in that process of you going up on stage to get better, you're gonna find yourself stagnant. You're gonna find yourself just stuck, never doing the thing you were meant to do. So that's what it means by crossing the threshold. You have to accept that your ego is going to die and you have to push forward into the unknown. This brings us to the next stage, which is congelation or tests allies enemies. So in this stage, you may start to feel hopeful, rooted, stable, and This stage for me was the first time I did mushrooms. Um, I had this experience where like I dissolved in the universe as we talked about and every part of me was surrounded with overwhelming love. And I finally found a piece inside of me that was sort of like, I can do this. I'm capable of doing this. I can move forward. And as I did that, I really, I really hit a spot where I started to feel like a little bit rooted in the ground. I felt like I could maybe accomplish some shit. And so that allowed me to move forward. Now, when we start talking about the different roadblocks to this, complacency, comfort, and overconfidence. This is something I see quite often. People hit that spot where they overcome their first trial. They overcome their first barrier to moving forward. And when they overcome that, they throw themselves a huge party. They're like, I fucking did it. I am victorious over myself. I figured it out. I figured myself out. And they fall into this place of complacency where they kind of think that they're going to, by putting a Band-Aid on the one problem they've fixed so far, that they've fixed everything. And for most of us, that's just not the case. Oftentimes, the first time you do some of this work is the time where you are just fixing one minor outward problem that needs to be fixed. We can also find ourselves in a place of overconfidence. Simply put, you can find yourself after that first big non-ordinary reality experience, you find yourself in a place where you're like, I got this, we're good, I figured it out. And that, again, is not the way to move forward through this journey. You know if you get quiet with yourself and you put the ego to the side that there are bigger dragons yet to be slayed inside of you brings us forward to step number seven, which is cybation or approaching the inmost cave. So in this stage, you may feel prepared, determined. You probably will feel a bit anxious as well. This is kind of the stage right before the big battle, and it's natural to feel a little bit prepared. You're going to feel determined and focused, but you're also going to feel a little bit anxious. Like, I don't know what's going to come up. I don't know how this is going to go. And it is natural to feel that way and the more you can accept those emotions and know that it's natural to feel that way the easier you're going to be able to move forward the roadblocks at this stage are going to be allowing the anxiety to overwhelm you distrust of your inner knowing and unwillingness to prepare so number one if you're unwilling to prepare for your big ordeal your big battle with what's in yourself if you refuse to take it seriously and you refuse to prepare for it when you get to it you're going to be not prepared and it won't go well (laughs) and then you'll be set back and you'll have to try again and try again and it could be a really really negative cycle it's also distrusting of your inner knowing like if you know the thing that you need to do you know the dragon that is there for you to slay specifically and you allow distrust to sneak in about that thing you'll find yourself set back because you the longer you don't trust what is in you when you get quiet and when you allow yourself to listen 
the longer you're going to prolong this cycle. And again, like allowing anxiety to overwhelm. If you allow your anxiety to get your to get the best of you at this stage, you're going to find yourself just stuck right where you are, just anxious, knowing what you're supposed to do, but never doing it. And that can be a really, really crappy spot to be stuck. So that brings us to the penultimate step of the hero's journey in the magnum opus, which is sublimation or the ordeal. In this stage, you may feel electrified. You might feel complete surrender, flow, total non-attachment. All of these feelings of just like being so in the moment, so in the throes of the thing that you knew that you were here to work on. And it really... It's a stage that takes it all out of you, and there's no there's no coincidence that in the hero's journey, this stage is sort of represented by a death, because as you pass through this stage, parts of you die. Parts of you that weren't serving you, weren't helping you move forward to who you're supposed to be, have to die off at this stage for you to progress forward through it. The roadblocks here are gonna be over attachment to winning. That could be a killer. If you're like, I need to fix this whole problem right now, it needs to end today. If you're over attached to winning immediately, you're going to cause yourself a lot of pain because oftentimes the messages you get in the ordeal or in the sublimation are going to be messages that are going to take you time to work through. And you'll see that reflected in the further steps of the journey. And if you have a refusal to surrender, it's another huge roadblock. When you get into the ordeal, the things that are shown to you and the process that you know you need to undertake, you have to surrender to that process. You have to allow your ego to go away so you can listen to the things you need to know for your own personal psyche and how you can upgrade yourself. And if you're unwilling to give up that control, you're going to be stuck here for a long time. Of course, the last part of it is like refusal to be wrong. If you have such an attachment to being right about everything and the things that you're shown in this state, in this penultimate step, are that you were fucking wrong about a lot of stuff. And like, this is where I had my second mushroom journey. I was walked through all of the different ways that I fucked up, all of the different ways that I was an asshole to people that I loved. And if I had gone through that and I'd resisted the whole way and said like, no, 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 that wasn't me. It's not my fault. I wouldn't have gotten what I got out of it. It was super painful, but it was exactly what I needed in that moment because I needed to wake the fuck up. So you have to accept that like the shit that comes through in these moments is the stuff that you need to figure out and you have to let in new information for you to grow and move forward. So that brings us to step number nine, fermentation or reward seizing the sword. So at this step, you might feel whole you might feel energized, powerful, inspired. And this really can be a, a stage that people kind of get tripped up on. Um, this is the stage where you've just finished the ordeal and you're probably feeling pretty fucking good about yourself. You're like, I did it. I worked on the big bad thing. I kind of figured it out. And that can be an amazing feeling as always. But with the new information you've gained from these stages of non-ordinary reality consciousness or psychedelics, you need to then take that information you gained. And you need to, you know, grab the sword. You need to take it and bring it into the real world and actually implement it. And the roadblocks here are pretty simple. It's Number one, it's resistance to grabbing the sword. So it's resistance to taking what you learn and moving forward with it into the real world. And number two, it's refusal to relinquish that codependence. So this is the stage where you're shown how to stand on your own and shown who you can be as your own person. And if you then refuse to stand on your own or refuse to move forward as your own person and you want to continue to rely on that family member or that mentor or that person that you love and got in a relationship with, you're going to find that your process will be stunted because you're not truly standing on your own and becoming who you need to be. Now, this doesn't mean you need to cut off your mentor or cut off your lover 
or cut off your best friends. What it does mean, though, is that you need to take this step on seriously as a part where you begin to step up as your own person and make your own decisions. So perhaps for a while you stop asking for permission for every little thing you do, or if perhaps you stop every time you're a little bit unsure of yourself, you ask everyone you possibly can to try and get an answer so that it's not your fault if something goes wrong. This is the step where you take the mantle on and you begin to be your own person. And that's the reward that you're gaining from this inner work. It leads us into step number 10, which is exaltation and the road back. Now we talked a little bit about this one already. This is a spot I think a lot of people get stuck on, at least in my experience, and especially working with different plant medicines. You can feel in this stage messianic, infinite, untethered, unstoppable, like nothing can hurt you. And it's really, really important to think about in this stage, like the these feelings are kind of the pendulum swing for many of us. And these are feelings of like, I experienced the infinite, I experienced everything, like I experienced total love in my heart, or I finally accepted myself. And that is an amazing feeling of power. And it can be something that you drink in for the first time. You're like, this is amazing. I'm so glad I found this. Now, there are a few roadblocks at this stage that I think trip a lot of people up if we're not looking for them. So the roadblocks here are a closed mind, and it can be really easy to get stuck in this. You hit this point where you're like, I finally know who I am, and I know who I am, and I know what's moving forward, and then you close off your mind to all new information from other people. It's not a way to live. You don't know everything. I don't know everything. So as you move forward, you need to be ready to like take in new information that may further adjust your behavior as you go. If you find yourself in this stage knowing, air quotes, rather than listening, that is a good sign that you're going to hit a roadblock. When we try to know everything and be that know-it-all person that's like, no, I know who I am now and I know everything, then you're going to run into a lot of problems in the real world. And also the best way to summarize the roadblock people run into at this stage is sort of an understanding of they feel like I am God rather than we all are God. When you start to feel like you are uniquely fucking special and no one else around here is, that can be a huge problem because that's the point where you separate from the whole, from the tribe, and you allow yourself to feel as if you are something different. And that's just not a recipe for winning. Brings us to the 11th stage, multiplication or resurrection. So this stage, you may find yourself feeling grounded, fresh, revitalized, purposeful, and this can be the stage where things finally start to click. Things start to fit into place. You're kind of returning to the normal world and you're starting to see some of the big picture map of how you're going to integrate this into what your normal life is. It's going to be a beautiful stage. Like you'll feel so just grounded, deeply rooted in who you are. And it's a wonderful feeling when you're first feeling it. Now, there are a couple of roadblocks here. Number one is just going to be unwillingness to continue to tend to the fire. You've been given this knowledge, you've been given given this gift to bring back to the world, but it requires active care from you as an individual. So you can't just go, great, I learned the thing, we're done, I figured it out, we're all good, and not continue to learn. You need to continue to actively stoke the fire. So that can be things like meditation, cold showers in the morning, things that you find difficult to do, eating a clean diet, yoga, float tanks, reading, journaling. These things are what is going to stoke the fire of your new understanding and your new knowledge within you and allow it to grow and grow and grow and multiply. You also might find resistance at this stage to integrating the divine with the mundane. Now, this is a concept that I've run into quite a few times that could be difficult. You kind of feel this ethereal beauty, especially in like a psychedelic experience. It's so just effervescent and every piece of it is just glowing with love. And there's so much going on. It's so it's so information dense and you're just so lit up by it. And then you come back to your normal world. And if you're working a normal fucking job nine to five, there could be a lot of resistance in how do I bring this unexplainable, ineffable experience into resonance with my normal day-to-day life. 
And that's the real magic of this step, is you have to take the time to take the things you learned and get what your action plan is. If you've been shown like, wow, I have no self-love, cool. What is your day-to-day -day plan going forward of how you are going to show yourself more self-love? That's the real magic of this step, and that's why it's the resurrection and multiplication step. You're going to resurrect yourself as a new you, and you're going to multiply your results if you allow yourself to create a clear plan of action to move forward with what you've learned. That's going to kick you into the final step, and what I believe is the most important step, both in general, but also at this exact time in history. You know, I'm sitting here in my house as we are dealing with coronavirus, and the earth is kind of crying out for help in its own way. And the 12th step is projection or return with the elixir. So in this step, you may be feeling interconnected, full, peaceful, loving, and grateful. Basically, you have come back with your knowledge, you have integrated it into your life, and now you are sharing the message with those in your tribe. It's just such a peaceful feeling. Like, you know you're right where you need to be, right when you need to be there. And this is the medicine that is within us all. This is the medicine that is uniquely yours, uniquely mine, to share with the world. And by doing this, you are going to allow that ripple that you are to spread. And when you allow that ripple to spread, when you allow yourself to be the pebble in the pond that causes ripples cascading out into eternity, you're allowing yourself to do the work that you were here to do in the first place. We just had to remove all of these other layers of bullshit that have been layered on by friends and family and loved ones and teachers and society. And as we remove those, you see who you are underneath just shining so bright. So allow yourself to remove those layers. And the, the resistance at this step or the roadblock at this step is pretty simple. It's just resistance to restarting the painful cycle all over again because fortunately and unfortunately, you won't go through only one of these cycles in your life. You'll go through many of them. And as you go through many of them, each time you complete one, you're going to find a moment of just like, oh, fuck, that was a lot. I don't want to do that again. And just listen to yourself. It is okay to celebrate. It's okay to enjoy your victory. But at a certain point, it will be time to go back in, find the dragon, the new dragon that has arisen, and go and slay that dragon as well and allow yourself to move forward. So that is it for that piece of things. So that brings us to the end of this talk. Now, I hope you got something out of this, and I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope it was useful for you as it was for me as I was discovering it. It's something that I think when you really spend the time and the effort to sort of journal on these different stages of the hero's journey and of the magnum opus, that as you analyze your past through these different lenses and through these different filters, you can really start to see where exactly you are in this journey. And as you start to see that, you'll start to be able to unpack, like, what's my next step? What's the thing I'm stuck on? Maybe what are the roadblocks I'm experiencing right now personally? It really has been something that as I unpacked the whole cycle of the hero's journey that I went through in my early 20s, I was able to just see in stark contrast, like, oh, those four stages were the ones that I had a lot of difficulty on. And it kind of gives me a little bit of a guidebook of the next time I go through this, those are probably the spots where I'm going to have some difficulty again, because there's parts of my personality and my upbringing that are going to cause those pieces to be hard. So go through this cycle, identify it for yourself, and allow yourself the gift of knowing where you are and how you can move forward. And I'll give out a couple of resources. So in the notes of this video you'll be able to just click over to my website and on my website i'll put all of this stuff up so you have access to this talk you have access to the different slides that i've shown throughout it and also as well you will have access if you so choose you can book a free 30 minute session with me and we'll go through and quickly unpack where you are at or if you want to dive a little bit deeper you can also book a paid coaching session with me we can set that up find a time we'll sit down over zoom and we can go super deep on where you are at but 
with love. I hope that this was impactful. It sure felt impactful as I was in uncovering it. So I'm sending this out there free of charge that I hope people find use in it. The real goal here is that we can all become aware of what our stories are. And as we become aware of our stories, we can start to do the work that is so important right now for us each to change our story into what it is supposed to be. So much love, everyone. Thank you for watching if you made it this far, and I'll talk to you soon.